All right, guys, the SC is finally over, or at least until I find out the results in December. But this means that I'm back at creating videos and continuing some of the playlists that we had started here on this channel. Today, we're going to continue on win loads, but now exploring a new procedure. Let's go. This figure from ASC 716 summarizes everything about wind loads on these provisions. For main wind force resisting systems, chapter 27 and 28 essentially deal with buildings and there are four different methods between these two chapters. Chapter 27, we have part one and part two. And chapter 28, we have part one and part two as well. And then chapter 29 is for essentially miscellaneous components. We have overhangs, parapets, we have non-building structures and other structures not related to building. That's why we're gonna stick to these four parts essentially in chapters 27 and 28. We actually already did part two of chapter 28 and now we're going to cover part one. Okay, so in chapter 28 we got parts one and parts two. It's really helpful to follow these steps um, that are provided in each chapter, in each section of ASC. Part two here, we went through all these steps and we solved our, our example building following these steps. And at the end of the day, we were looking for this pressure here. We found this lambda factor, KZT and P sub S30. And we found what these pressures were for each respective zone. We had zones A through H in this case. Now for part one here, we essentially follow all these steps, but ultimately we are still trying to find the building pressures. Now it's just that we are following a different figure. We don't have or zones A through H. We now have zones one through four with the corner zones being denoted with an E for again, the same load combinations or load cases as we had in part two. Case A being when the wind is blown on the long side of the building or towards the short direction. And then case B, when the wind is blowing on the short side of the building parallel to the long direction. It's the same thing for uh, part one. Now, what's different with part one is because we have different limitations. We can use both methods for the building that we are using in our example, but there are conditions where one method is valid, whereas the other one is not. And I'll start with some of the definitions that are the same for both parts, both methods. First is that both of them, they are essentially for low rise buildings, which means that these buildings are less than 60 feet and their height is also less than the least horizontal dimension. And then we have these conditions here that are essentially the same for both methods, that the building needs to be regular shaped and we can't have all these specific conditions here that because of the site or because of the geometry of the building. Now, what starts to be a little bit different here is that in part two, that was a very simple method that was only allowed for enclosed buildings. Now for part one, we can use this method for enclosed, partially enclosed, or even open buildings. Part two, it had to be a rigid building, which means that the building period has to be less than one. It had to be a simple diaphragm and the building had to be essentially symmetrical in cross section in each direction. And the building had to be exempt from torsional load cases or the these torsional load cases do not control and they are explicitly mentioned in note 5 of this figure here so you see that there are a lot of a lot of requirements with part 2 whereas part 1 it starts to get a little bit more lenient and we'll see when we go to chapter 27 that it gets even more lenient until we get to the all heights method. So this is our example. It's the same example that we used in our previous problem. It's a building in West Palm Beach, Florida that has the parameters below. We 
want to find out what the wind pressures are, what all the zones are, so that if we were to put these pressures in a computer model, we know exactly where to input all these different pressures. And we have here all the different parameters for, for this building. In this question now, I am specifically asking that we design this using the envelope procedure part one. So we need to calculate the velocity pressure, Q sub H, and then we need to now calculate this new coefficient called GC sub PF. This is different from the previous method. So it's a new coefficient from a new figure that we're going to get all these specific numbers. Step three, calculate the wind pressure P, which I showed the equation previously, and then we'll cal calculate the zone widths now, because zones 1 through 4 are different than zones A through H from part 2, so we need to see the width of each of these zones so that we can calculate the area, the surface area of each zone. Step 5, we actually calculate the zone pressures and compare to code minimums, which is something that I don't recall if I explained in the previous videos video, but we always need to check at least the minimum pressure that is specified by the code. Because our wind speed is so high, I doubt that our pressures would be less than the code minimum, but it's also a check that we need to, to perform. And then step six is a really important step because we're actually going to compare parts one versus parts part two and see what results we get and how do they how they compare, you know, two codified approaches to see which one gives us a higher pressure or less pressure and how accurate the two of them or how close the two of them are. So this is the first step. It's pretty straightforward. You can just reference the numbers from the problem statement and apply this equation here for Q sub H and we get our velocity pressure as 59 PSF. Step two now is a little bit more elaborate that we need to find our external pressure coefficients, GCPF. And this is for load case A and load case B. For us to get this coefficient, essentially we need to first understand what these two load cases are, which I explained before that load case A is essentially when we are applying the wind load on the long surface of the building, the long side of the building. And load case B, we are applying the wind load on the short side of the building. Then we go to this figure here from ASE 716, chapter 28, for part one. This figure essentially tells us what these coefficients are. So if we're looking at load case A, for example, and in our case we have a flat roof for zone one, which is this zone here on the wall zone, our coefficients should be 0.4, right? And for load case B, that same zone one should be negative 0.45. And the negative coefficient here essentially means that we will have a negative pressure for zone one, whereas for load case A, this will be a positive pressure or acting towards the surface. So if we fill out this entire table, here you can get all the different coefficients for all the zones. Now step three, we calculate our wind pressure. We take our velocity pressure times the external pressure coefficient minus the internal pressure coefficient. Because we have an, inter an enclosed building, this internal pressure coefficient is essentially going to be plus or minus 0 0.18. And again, we have a table with you know, the internal pressure coefficient here, and we run two conditions. One condition that the internal pressure is positive, and one condition that the internal pressure is negative. I'm going through this so that we show the entire process, but when we actually model these buildings, because it's an enclosed building, the internal pressure is going to cancel out for the overall base shear calculation of the building. And here you see all the pressures that we get when we essentially apply this equation. Now for step four, we want to calculate the A dimension and the 2A dimension so that we know the width of our zones. And this is essentially to find out here what is this number so that we can multiply by the building height and get that area for the entire zone. And then zone A is also right here. 
the calculation, I am essentially going through this notation A here, which states that the A value is either 10% of the least horizontal dimension, which is 9 feet, or 40% of the building height, but not less than either 4% of least horizontal dimension or 3 feet. I also did this check right here, which does not control. So our A is 9 feet and our 2A is 18 feet. Step 5, now we need to calculate the zone pressures and compare to code minimums. This is the fun part, and I know this is a lot of numbers, but I'm going to give you guys also this whole example here so that you can reference it on your own or compare it to maybe your solution if you're trying to solve it on your own. What I did here was essentially I calculated the zone area for each zone, which zone 1 here in this case, if we go back, would be the building width, the long side of the building, minus 18 feet, which is 2A, times the building height. That would essentially give this area here, 2550 square feet. The wall pressure we calculated from a previous table, which for zone 1 is 13 PSF. If we go back here, zone 1, we got 13 PSF. And then the horizontal load is just multiplying one by the other, and we have multiplying the wall pressure by the zone area. We have 33.2 kips. This was for positive internal pressure, and then we do the same thing for negative internal pressure. And this is the statement for the code minimum pressures. We have 16 here for walls and 8 PSF for the roof. And that's this check that I have on the side here for the wall pressure and the horizontal load, which essentially takes the wall pressure times the area. We get a total of 131.7 kips for the base shear, whereas for the code minimum base shear, we have 96. So in this case, we would still use our calculated pressures as opposed to the code minimum. And then we do the same thing here for uplift. I calculated the pressures, I calculated my total uplift for the part one procedure as well as the code minimum and our part one procedure controls. We then do the same thing for load case B and we find out that our base shear controls over the code minimum. And this is essentially how you would get all your pressures, you calculate your base shear and you can input all these different pressures here into a computer program or your hand calculations and design your, your lateral system. Our last step is how does this compare? How do we compare part one versus part two? Well, I actually put them side by side here for both our base shear and also our uplift. And we'll see here that in both cases, it was actually pretty close for load case A and B part one and part two, we only have a difference of 0.61% that part two was higher. And then when we looked at uplift, part one was higher, 479 as opposed to 442.9. So we had a slightly higher pressure. So as we can see here, these two procedures are very, very similar. And honestly, I don't know why ASC7 has all these different procedures when it would be so much simpler to just have one or maybe two procedures that cover most cases. Because I don't know about you, uh, let me know your feedback, but we typically don't use all these different procedures in, in practice. We stick to maybe one or two. I know this was an extensive example with a lot of number crunching, a lot of tables, but if you click on the link on the description below, you can download it and you can use it as a reference as you study for the PE, the SE, or just to get better at calculating wind loads. And on the next videos, we're going to go into chapter 27 and solve the same example using the directional procedure, part one and part two, and we'll see how they compare with these two procedures that we finished. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.